This week on the Read Well podcast, we're going to be talking about poetry and whether it's worth your time to read or not. Now, the short answer from my perspective is that it is absolutely worth your time. But many people feel like it's hard to understand or that it's esoteric or that it's an older form of literature and instead want to focus on newer forms of nonfiction, something that will move their career forward or their personal life in some way. I'm going to make the case today that poetry is in fact one of the greatest ways to ground yourself, get some mental clarity, and find pure happiness. I'm going to share with you some of my favorite poems that I have come across. Um, We're not going to go into huge detail because poetry can take hours and hours, but I want to share some of my favorite verses. I'm also going to share with you a short poem I wrote this week because of all this homework. And of course, as always, I will give you a book recommendation that I think is going to just light you up. All right, let's get philosophical. Welcome to this week's episode of the Read Well Podcast. My name is Eddie Hood, and I'm your host, where I believe it's more important to read well than to be well-read. So grab your favorite book, open up your notes, and let's get ready to learn something fascinating. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. I want to thank you for taking so much time to listen to the podcast. I've gotten so much great feedback from all of you and have felt so much support and love from the reading community. This past week has been incredible. Just to give you a sense of what's going on here, in just the past week or so, we've had 5,782 downloads of the podcast. That's incredible. That tells me that people want to read books. They want to learn to read closely, to slow down, to take notes, and to apply the ideas. And that just means the world to me that we are finding a community of people who want to be better readers. I also asked for help a few weeks back on getting some testimonials for the podcast on Apple iTunes, and you guys have done an incredible job, and I cannot thank you enough for taking time out of your day to do that. I just wanted to share one with you. This is from Gary, who has recently joined our community. He wrote uh, with a five-star review titled, Loving This. He said, while this podcast and related community has a motto to read slowly, take notes, and apply the ideas, I have to say I consumed the entire podcast in my first week, have joined the community, And with weekly book club gatherings of people of like mind, a passion for reading well and making sense out of what we read. While some of the podcast episodes are a little redundant, it's nice that they are generally short and concise and easily digested. Time well spent. I want to thank Gary for sharing that with us. He has been a fantastic member in our book clubs and in the community and just has given me some great feedback. And I want to open this up to you and let you know that I'm here as the host of this podcast on YouTube. I'm waiting for you to reach out to me and tell me how I can make this community more meaningful for you. I want you to feel like this is your home, a place for you to go and think and get away from the distractions of the world. Now, with that in mind, today we're talking about a very special topic. We're talking about poetry. Poetry has a very near and dear place to my heart because many of you might not know this, but when I was a teenage boy (laughs) from the age of about 11 to 21, all I ever wanted to do was be a rock and roll star. In fact, I had a band. We recorded several CDs. I got into university on a scholarship playing guitar. I was going to be a jazz guitarist. My ultimate goal was to write music for movies and be a studio musician. I had my whole life planned out. I was going to go to Berkeley and it was going to be great. And then things changed. And I'm very happy with where I'm at in life. I'm glad I actually didn't take that path. But in that space of my life, I did a lot of lyrical writing. I wrote many songs, wrote lots of poetry, read lots of poetry, and then I moved away from it. I moved away from it because I got serious about life, right? I had to sit down and go to college, and I became an accountant, and I had to uh, really put my nose to the grindstone from that, you know, 21 years old to you know, even just a few years ago, it has been a lot of really hard hustling. And I think that's why reading has become so meaningful to me again in the past few years. And now why poetry is very meaningful because I have realized that my life is moving by at a rapid pace, rapid pace. And I am trying to slow that clock down and pay more attention to what's happening around me. Books help me do that. Books help me see the world in a new way They help me appreciate the world in a new way, and they help me think critically for myself. So uh, a couple weeks ago, I started ordering some books of poetry and uh, have really, really enjoyed this process. And today, I'd like to share with you 
some passages. And we're gonna talk about why poetry is helpful. But first of all, let's talk about these poems I'm choosing. Now, two of my favorite poets are some of the greatest ever. We've got Emily Dickinson on the table today and Walt Whitman. Now, Walt Whitman is just this titan of American literature, right? He wrote The Leaves of Grass, and you can buy this now anywhere. I mean, you can find it in pretty much any bookstore. And it's this wonderful book of poetry that is just chock full of the beauty of life. So Walt was often described as the kind of person that could make beauty out of anything. He could see the good and the sublime in a bucket of rust. In fact, he spent time with people like Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, who we'll be talking about later today in the podcast. And they were always in awe of Walt because he had this uncanny ability to take just a crummy situation and revel in it and just, just be alive in it. He was this person that was just alive. And they saw just how it was almost a spiritual calling for Walt to just be present, to be here. So uh, we're gonna read just one small passage from one of his most popular poems called Song of Myself. Now, Song of Myself is very long. Uh, in fact, I'm looking right now, it is well over 50 pages, if not more. Yeah, it's like probably closer to 80 pages in the book that I'm holding. It's a very long poem, so we're not going to read all of it. But if you've never read Song of Myself, this is something I would encourage you to do. In fact, I am considering making this one of the reads for the book club that I host online. And if you're interested in joining that book club, all you do is go to the readwellpodcast.com. You'll go up into the top uh, navigation there and you'll see where it says community. Uh, you'll click on that. That's my private reading community. We have a lot of friends in there. You can join absolutely free. It's It kind of works like Facebook, but it's not Facebook. So there's no Facebook ads and there's no random people talking about political stuff and all that other garbage. It's just a group of readers who talk about really great books. Uh, and that's where I host my book club as well. I'm thinking of potentially having Song of Myself be one of our pieces of literature that we study as a group. I think that would be fantastic. Now, this is a poem that celebrates life. I can't think of anything better to do with my reading time than to read something that celebrates life. Because when I go out into the day, I feel the weight of my life. I feel the weight of the world. I don't necessarily have that redemptive joy that Walt Whitman always has uh, with him, that he carries with him. You're going to feel his spirit in these words. Now, I want, uh, I, I can't demand, but I would love for you to just listen to these few short lines and try to understand what he's hoping to convey to you as the reader. Because here's what I found about poetry. When you read poetry, it can often feel confusing because the, the poet is using uh, sometimes amorphous words like amorphous. <laughs> uh, he or she is using metaphor and symbolic meaning. And sometimes they're trying to tell you something that it is a much deeper level than the words themselves are conveying. And you could sit with a poem in some cases, especially Emily Dickinson, who we'll get to in a moment. You could spend weeks or months or years, you could take full semester classes on her poems and still uncover potential meaning. So is there a right or a correct meaning to a poem? I'm gonna say that there's not, and here's why. Because poetry is a two-way street. When you read poetry, you are bringing something to that conversation. You are bringing your own experiences, your own mental game, your own fear, worry, joy, appetite, and questions about life. And as you bring all of that baggage to this poetry, it's going to mean something different to you than it will to your best friend or to your mother or to your neighbor. That is why poetry is so powerful because it is something that is unique in the reading for you. Now, if you read a contemporary fiction book, let's say Harry Potter or Stephen King or something, and you read that, the meaning is pretty clear. You're following a character through a series of events. You know what the author is trying to convey to you, and it's pretty well laid out what's happening. Same with nonfiction, even more so. There are facts presented. It's usually presented with headings and subheadings, and it has been edited to death just to make sure you get the exact meaning of the scientific research or the study that was done. But with poetry, Poetry has all sorts of waves and undulations in it that allow you to consider what it means to you and how it feels in your mouth and in your mind and in your body. So poetry 
is an experience. It's not a reading, it's an experience. So let's read just the first few stanzas here of Song of Myself. Again, this is a poem by Walt Whitman, the great American poet who is writing to celebrate life. He says, I celebrate myself and sing myself. And what I assume you shall assume for every atom belongs to me as good belongs to you. So we're starting off with this concept that we are going to be celebratory in life, right? We are going to sing. We're going to face the day with some positive energy. And I love how he says every atom that belongs to me as good belongs to you. So he's got a little bit of an egalitarian thing going on here where he's saying like, this world is as much mine as it is yours. Uh, we are all created equal and we get to share in this joy, share in the celebration. Now, the next part I love because it goes directly in contradiction to the American hustle culture, right? I Don't get me wrong. I am a proud American. I am proud of my country, but I am sick and tired of the hustle culture, right? I am sick and tired of working to the bone with nothing to show for it other than a pile of bills to be paid and stress to be managed at the end of the day. And I think people like Walt Whitman and Henry David Thoreau had something figured out when they realized, I have enough, I'm happy. I don't need to go out and get more to make myself feel good. I have enough. And so let's listen to this next passage. He says, I loaf, he uses the word loaf, L-O-A-F-E, which is to lie around, right? Uh, we, we might think in the hustle culture, if you're a loafer, you're lazy, you're useless, you're not out earning money and busting your backside, you're, you're, <laughs> you're sitting around doing nothing. He says, I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. Okay, so I picture this, this uh, young man, he says later on in, in the passage here that he's about 37 years old. Yeah, 37 years old. So you've got a 37 year old guy who's sitting out on the summer hill and it's a beautiful day. And instead of trying to find happiness through symbolic means or through how much money is in his bank account, he's finding happiness by lying on this hill, looking at a spear of summer grass. And this reminds me of a conversation I had with a friend, another member in the book club, who I have known for many years. He's a dear friend. He's probably one of the best fathers I've ever met. So uh, if you're listening to this, you know who you are, and I'm grateful for your friendship. But anyway, he pointed out that uh, he loves being with his, his child because the child at random times will just find pure joy in the most common things, things that, that as an adult, we, we would just pass by and not consider. And I think poetry gets us back into that mindset of paying attention to the spears of summer grass. In fact, a couple nights ago, actually this was last night, I took my son, who's nine years old, to karate. The kid is a karate genius. He's incredible. I'm not just saying that because I'm dad, but he's fantastic. Anyway, I took him to karate and next to the karate dojo is this railroad track and this train is going past and I'm getting in the car telling him, come on, hustle, we gotta go. I used the word hustle, right? I'm, I'm in that like, go, go, go mind frame. And he's just standing there with his arms to his side, watching this train go by. Just like his eyes are huge and they're beautiful and his mouth is open, like wide open. And he's trying to count the cars. And I knew instantly what he was doing. And I got frustrated because I was in a hurry. I didn't say anything, but I got frustrated because I was like, we don't have time for this. And then I remembered my friend in book club who was raving about his daughter being so mesmerized by commonplace things. And I also remembered Song of Myself because I had read it that morning and I pictured Walt lying on the hill, just appreciating a blade of grass. So then I stopped, I turned and I faced the train and I began counting cars. And at the end of that, when the caboose flew by, it was like 10 minutes later, my son went, wow, that was like, 200 cars or whatever he said that was so long and he was so excited about it and i felt sheepish and grateful at the same time for what my son and poetry had taught me so yes poetry is absolutely worth reading because it will teach you that all this stuff you think is important might not be 
I'm not saying that it is not important. I'm saying that it might not be important. So that is just a really small taste of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. And it is a beautiful book of poetry. I highly encourage you to get it. And anytime you are feeling like you need a little bit of beauty in your life, pick up Walt Whitman and uh, read a few passages and see what he has to say. Hey everyone, I want to take just a quick second in the middle of this podcast to tell you about Highlightish.com. Think of highlighting a book, but add I-S-H at the end. Highlightish.com is the tool that I use to make better book notes and to organize my writing. It's where I go to capture my favorite passages, annotate them, and then to turn that research into essays, blog posts, or research papers. If you're someone that wants to get more out of the books that you love and you want to turn that into great output, go to Highlightish.com today. Thanks for listening and let's get back to the show. Okay, let's move on to Emily Dickinson. She's actually probably my favorite poet of all time. And there's a reason why, because Emily is like an onion. This is the worst metaphor I could possibly use because it is cliche, but I'm gonna use it. She is layered and layered and layered. I have taken courses on her poetry and walked away from those courses (laughs) thinking I understood Emily and then I Uh, read the poet again and realized that there is just so much more. This woman was very mysterious. She, She was very introverted. She didn't ever really leave her bedroom. She stayed in her home most of her adult life and wrote her poems. She did not expect her poems to be published. Um, In fact, so much so that she never even titled them. She just wrote a bunch of prose and she would send these prose to friends and family and people that uh, she cared for In her lifetime, I believe only seven poems were ever published. So when she passed away, all of her friends and family just just felt that her work was so profound and so good that they compiled it. And this is how we have come to know who Emily Dickinson is. I'm going to read to you one of her most famous poems. Uh, And it is, if you're looking at her annotated book of poetry, it's poem number 1129. Uh, And it's just eight lines, but it's a very powerful poem about truth. She says, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Now, if you've been in literary circles for much of your life, or you've read much, or you've been around any kind of poetry, you've probably heard this line. This is a very famous line of poetry. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies, too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. Okay, so that's the poem. It's eight lines and it's completely filled with uh, (laughs) hours and hours of conversation. I'll give you two thoughts here to think about. She's asking us to tell the truth, but she's asking us to do it in a way that is done with some grace. Okay, so when you are working with people that you love, friends and family, you can't just come out and tell them the hard truth at times. You need to do it in a way that will help them appreciate the truth in the long run. Because sometimes, have you ever been just told the truth flat out and then you're just, you resent that person or you feel offended or you feel attacked? So even if it is true, you're going to push that truth away because it hurt you emotionally, right? And so Emily is trying to teach you that when you share these truths, there's a right way and a wrong way to do this. I like how she says, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. So the word all is a very unique choice of word. And when you start to analyze poetry, you might think to yourself, what does all mean? And now again, you get to bring your own interpretation to her poem. Emily had her way of interpreting this poem that does not make it the only way to interpret the poem, okay? So you get to apply this to your life and use it as a tool to live a better life. Tell all the truth. For me, all could mean one of two things. She's either encouraging us to never tell a lie, right? Everything that comes out of my mouth, all of the pieces of information will be true. Is she asking us to do that or, Is she asking us to dig down deep inside, 
for that thing we've been hiding, the thing that we don't want anybody to know, the thing that if we let it out of the bag would ultimately make us happy because we would then be living our true authentic selves. But we're afraid to do it because we don't want to be judged. We don't want to be hated amongst our peers and our community and our society. So we bottle it up and we keep it down. Is she telling us that? Is she telling us to let that out and let everybody know our truth, to let everybody hear our voice? I'm leaning to the latter. I am leaning to the latter and saying that she is encouraging us to live our lives in the best fashion possible. But she says that we need to do it in slant. We can't just come out and say, hey, I'm this thing, or this is what I believe, or this is you know, how I live. You have to do it in a way that garners support over time. And I think that's a very wise poem. So again, if you are looking for some poetry that will make you think, that will make you consider uh, all of the different meanings and give you something really to chew on, Emily Dickinson, is the way to go. Now, the next thing I wanna share with you is that this got me thinking about my own personal life and I have gone through some challenges that have been emotionally difficult for me. If you've been listening to the whole podcast, if, if you binge uh, listened to it like Gary has, then you'll know that a few months ago, actually it's been about six months now, I stepped away from the Mormon church, which was a very big part of my life and have since moved into uh, studying philosophy and I've found a lot of value. Uh, I have found my home there. To me, it is complete joy to be studying philosophy and, and I feel like I'm thinking critically for myself. But in, in leaving that belief system, uh, especially when I live in Utah, where so many people here are members of this church and it is culturally everywhere, and you're a little bit of a black sheep if you're not a member of the church, it has been hard for me to process that and deal with that. And as I've been reading these poems these past couple of weeks, I've realized that I personally have some some emotion that I need to deal with, that I need to process. And I just started journaling and writing my thoughts down. And out of those thoughts came a very simple poem that I wrote that I hope it's okay. I'd like to share it with you today, not to share my work or to get applause from you, but simply to share with you the fact that you can use words yourself to help you understand your own emotions and what you're thinking. Okay, so I titled this poem, The Sea of Philosophy. Here we go, people, buckle up. Let me qualify this. This is in no way, <laughs> it feels really weird sharing this after sharing poems by the two greatest poets ever to have walked on the earth, or at least two of the best. But I think that's important, right? Because at, at the Readable Podcast, we read slowly, we take notes and we apply the ideas. I'm simply trying to apply the idea. I'm trying to make poetry my own. The sea of philosophy is wide and worn deep. It spans in all directions, unending and complete. In an ocean, first tranquil, then unhinged, and I am but a traveler sailing its brim. I peek over the edge of this boat of mine to find on the surface a reflection supine. I'm alone on the water, the sun is losing its height, when just below the surface swim schools of delight and terror. Who knows what's beneath, eager to devour, or perhaps there's refuge in this my needful hour. The waves are coming, rolling and wash, pushing and pulling and driving my loss. Then one thought rises with critical amend. When I scan the horizon, what lies at the bend? It's cold now, huddled, waiting on this raft, filled with questions I know I must ask. If I dive into the deep, if I thrash for my life, a new day will come from the perilous night. Okay, that's the poem that I wrote this week. I'm pretty happy with it. There are some things I'd like to change, as with all poems. <laughs> I haven't written a poem in 25 years, but there's a few things I wanna point out about this, and then I'm gonna give you the book recommendation for this week, which I think you're absolutely going to love. So the imagery in my poem here is of a man sitting on a boat in a wide ocean, of course, and that ocean is philosophy, and it goes in every possible expansive direction. Uh, he can't see land, and below him is the unimaginable. I wrote There Swim Schools of Delight. I'm doing a little play on words here because as we know, there are schools of fish. And if you've ever gone snorkeling, it's beautiful to see huge schools of fish swimming by and it's just this gorgeous thing. But the play on words as well, because the ocean represents philosophy, 
I am suggesting that there are schools of delight down below. There are different schools of philosophy from stoicism to pragmatism to existentialism and so on. And there's just so much to learn and it's all swimming down there. But I also wrote that there are terrors down below, uh, potentially things that could devour. And some people have found that when they dig into specific kinds of philosophy, they actually get more sad than they do happy because some branches of philosophy ask you to ask existential questions of yourself that don't always have the answer. So the most famous form of philosophy or school of philosophy that does this is nihilism, which is the branch of philosophy which believes that life is pretty much absurd. There's no point to this. What's the point of living, right? Uh, Albert Camus was uh, a proponent of this and uh, a few others. So you get the idea there. And, and you really want to swim in these waters, or I want to swim in these waters, but I have to do so with some judiciousness, right? And really be aware of what's happening. But I know that if I sit in this boat and I do nothing, I'm going to freeze to death. I have to dive in. I have to start asking these really hard questions. And if I can do that, if I dive into the deep, if I thrash for my life, in other words, if I, if I go swimming and I put in the work and I ask the questions and I learn and I and I do more than sit and be scared, then a new day will come from the perilous night. And I use the word perilous at the end because that's a little how it feels to leave a belief system that has been so close to your heart, a belief system that has structured every thought and decision and <laughs> family outing, all of that stuff. You know, when you lose that, it feels a little perilous at times. And so, but I believe that by asking the right questions and by getting educated myself, that a new day will come and I feel that I can feel the sunshine on my skin as I read all these wonderful authors. Okay, it is time for this week's book recommendation and I am thoroughly honored and proud to share this one with you. It's called Henry at Work. The subtitle is Thoreau on Making a Living. It's written by Dr. John Cagg, who is a philosophy professor at UMass Lowell and his co-author is Jonathan Van Bill. Together they wrote a book that is beautiful uh, in its execution as it describes what Henry David Thoreau was trying to accomplish in writing his book, Walden. Now, if you've ever read Walden, which you probably have been exposed to it in 11th grade English at some point, it is a cornerstone of American literature because Thoreau, along with Emerson and a few others, were some of the foremost philosophers of American thinking. And Thoreau took a very unique approach to American philosophy. Instead of spending his time lecturing and sitting in armchairs and going to school halls, he went out and did it, <laughs> right? He's, he took all of the knowledge and said, I'm just going to go live this way and I'm going to write about it. And Thoreau was very unique in his ability to not be pulled by society's trinkets, the things that you know people obsess over, the things that we think will make us great and grand and beautiful. Thoreau didn't care about any of that. Thoreau left his life in Concord, Massachusetts, and went into the woods and built a small cabin on Walden Pond, uh, which by the way, if you're ever in Boston, I highly suggest you go to Walden. Uh, it's a short drive out, and when you get there, you can park and you can go to the cabin and walk around Walden Pond. It is just an incredible, beautiful experience. But this is what he did. He built a cabin and he did so, so that he might live deliberately. And he lived in that cabin for two years two months and two days. He didn't live there his whole life. This was an experiment, okay? He did go back to Concord after that and he wrote and he published and he lived his life. But this book that I'm, I'm recommending today is titled Henry at Work. And what they've done that I like so well is they've analyzed what it means according to Henry David Thoreau's philosophy on doing meaningful work, which is something I think we all crave in our lives. At least I shouldn't speak for everybody, but I feel like this is probably important to most of us. We wake up and the work we do, we hope is meaningful. And how do you know that? How do you know if what you're doing matters, if it's important to you in the long run? And it's got me thinking. In fact, I've started writing my own essay on this which I'll share with the community when I'm done. It's going to take a while, but I'm trying to understand the art of meaningful work as well. So if you are the kind of person who really values your time and have come to understand that you probably spend more time with your colleagues and your boss than you do your spouse and your kids, because that's the nature of life, right? 
that it's probably a good idea to make sure that that time is well spent and that it is meaningful because you are giving up so much of your life to do it. So I encourage you to go pick up Henry at work, Throw on Making a Living by Dr. John Cag, K-A-A-G, and Jonathan Van Bill. I think you will absolutely love it. Hey, if you found this episode helpful, I want to thank you for listening. And I have a special request, if you don't mind. I am looking for guests to join me on the Readwell podcast. Now, I am looking for a very specific kind of guest. If you listened to last week's episode, I had the wonderful opportunity of interviewing Liza Jacobs. She is an audiobook narrator, and she brought a very unique voice to the show in helping us learn to read slowly, take notes, and apply the ideas. So I am trying to find people who can teach us how to do that, how to be critical readers and critical thinkers. So if you are somebody who is a professor or a teacher, an English teacher or a philosophy professor, or if you are a a published author and you have some insight on how to do that, feel free to reach out to me and uh, let me know. The best way to reach me is through my email. It's eddy, E-D-D-Y at thereadwellpodcast.com. You can do that or you can go to thereadwellpodcast.com. And then if you go down to the very bottom footer, you'll see a button that says contact. And if you click on that, you can fill out a form to request to be a guest on the show. And by doing that, I'm, I'm trying to bring conversation that inspires close and concise and thoughtful reading. So that's that's going to be important for the, the future shows coming down the road. I do want to say this. I'm not currently looking for people who are trying to sell self-published books. I, I have absolutely no issue with self-published authors. In fact, I have been a self-published author myself, but this isn't the right community for that. This isn't a place for us to be selling those books. This is a community and a podcast for learning how to read thoughtfully. So if you can bring voice to that and help us become better readers, then I would love to talk with you and have you on the show. So again, thank you for listening, everybody. It means the world to me that you're here. And if you find this show helpful in any way, please feel free to share it with a friend and encourage them to pick up a book. Until next week, as always, read slowly, take notes, and apply the ideas. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time. If you'd like to take your reading to the next level, then head on over to our website at thereadwellpodcast.com. There you can get access to my weekly newsletter as well as up-to-date show information. Also, don't forget that I learned software development on the side just so that I could build a program to help us make better book notes as we read. If you're interested, go to highlightish.com. Think of highlighting a book, but add ish, I-S-H, at the end. Highlightish.com. Thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll see you on the next show.